Hello everyone. I continue to research the worlds of my The Battle of Clans project. Today we will review the longest artificial life simulation I've ever run. It lasted for almost 9 million steps, which is 4 or 5 times longer than usual. In this simulation the starting environment is the same all over the map, causing the creation of the single ecosystem. Organisms can cause significant changes to the local and global environment, making the system unstable. I assume the world would never stay the same. Ecosystems will replace each other again and again. This was the initial idea behind the simulation. Let's briefly outline the simulation's rules. This is a sprout. Each sprout has a genome, which contains info about what the sprout is supposed to do. Right now a sprout is just a singular cell able to move, absorb energy from the soil, and consume other cells. With enough energy, a sprout can produce three branches. The sprout with branches becomes a transport cell. The branches can be red, blue, or green cells or new sprouts. Each new sprout carries a genome of its progenitor. Sometimes there's a deviation in the new sprout's genome. These deviations are the basis of evolution. Green cells generate energy by absorbing sunlight. Green cells can't exist next to each other. The amount of energy generated by green cells depends on the concentration of organic matter in the soil and the amount of free space around the cell. Green cells are the only source of energy in this world. Blue cells absorb energy from the soil. Red cells absorb organic matter from soil and turn it into energy. Transport cells deliver energy to sprouts and seeds. A sprout can become a seed. A seed consumes less energy. Sprout also can shoot seeds. This mechanism is used for claiming new territories or killing other cells. The cells in this simulation are immortal. They can only die from energy deficit or overflow, or get killed by other cells. Sprouts and seeds are the only cells capable of storing energy. When red and blue cells absorb all resources from soil, they die from energy deficit. Then their energy and organic matter return to the soil. All organic matter and energy are evenly distributed in the soil in a square of 3 by 3 cells. Oversaturation by either energy or organic matter makes the soil deadly for cells. Let's look at the distribution map of organic matter in the soil in two simulations. This is an accelerated video. White space is where there is little organic matter. Green cells produce almost no energy. The dark spots on the map are places with high concentrations of organic matter. Here green cells can produce more energy from sunlight. Oversaturation makes soil uninhabitable. Such places are marked in red on the map. This animated map shows how cells die and then energy and matter from their remain get consumed by others. You can notice how big is impact of organisms on the environment. I thought that this would make it impossible for the simulation to achieve stability. But I was wrong. All my experiments so far proved that the ecosystem may change many times. But it inevitably achieves stability, which can be only disrupted by external forces. For example, this is how the organic distribution map will look at the end of this simulation. The map will remain the same for the next several million steps. Let's get to the simulation. This world has existed for a hundred thousand steps. It is divided into two areas. In the left area, all life is concentrated in a small colony, located around the growing circle of excess organic matter. Life in the right area is on the brink of extinction. The two areas look like opposites. The left area has a single growing circle of organic matter in the otherwise empty world. The right area is a giant field of organic matter with a black hole inside. Life in both areas is concentrated on a thin border between the void and organic matter. Let's take a closer look at the colony in the left area. At the bottom, there is the deadly zone of excess organic matter. At the border, tiny organisms of few cells live. 
The high concentration of organic matter in the soil allows green cells to produce more energy. At the very border, one green cell per sprout is sufficient. Closer to the outer border of the colony, there is less organic matter in the soil, and instead of sprouts, seeds predominate, which require less energy. Even on such a thin line of living organisms, the separation into an inner and an outer layer is visible. To populate the rest of the area organisms with a high sprout-to-cell ratio are needed. There are no such organisms yet. Organisms in this colony cannot recycle organic matter that accumulates in the soil after cell death. For this reason, the zone with an excess of organic matter is growing, forming circles. This process is similar to the formation of stromatolites in our world as a result of the vital activity of colonies. Let's speed up the simulation a bit. Organisms in the right area have absorbed excesses of organic matter. Superorganisms have formed here. But in a few cycles, the world was in danger of complete extinction again because of excess organic matter. In both areas, we can see the birth of organic-consuming colonies inside fields of organic matter. By their appearance, it's evident they consist of various species, each with its purpose. In the right area ecosystem changes are more rapid. Right now it is dominated by dwarf superorganisms. Now I will remove the border between the two areas to see how they will interact. All the organisms in the simulation are descendants of the two original cells. I painted them green and blue depending on their ancestors. I will call them the green clan and the blue clan. Let's see how the clans will interact. The blue clan with its dwarf superorganisms has an advantage over neighbors. Note that blues dominate not by aggression, but by taking the free space by fast growth, leaving no place for the other clan. Let's speed up the simulation to witness the doom of the green clan. It seems there's little to no hope for the greens. But the green clan has mutated and this mutation will turn the tide. Now the mutants start to dominate the world, leaving traces of excess energy behind. The ecosystem changes rapidly. Almost all organisms die, including the mutants. The only species able to survive are organisms encased in a growing circle of excess energy. They manage to adapt in time. The world filled with energy favors organisms able to benefit from it. Colonies with energy-rich soil as their preferred environment, new colonies begin to settle the world. The new ecosystem is shaped.
The Blue Clan, once the top cat of the world, is in its final days. Now organisms of the Green Clan are the only inhabitants of the world. Now we can see the common landscape of the simulation. Some organisms generate excess energy, while others absorb it. Such harmony makes the colonies move. This is a close-up of a typical organism of the age. The whole world is one big colony of tiny organisms. Looks like the ecosystem is static, but at a closer look, you can see small changes occur here and there. I assumed a world inhabited by tiny colonial organisms is the most optimal and stable option in the simulation. But now we can see the formation of more complex organisms, taking more and more area. Here a tiny colony is surrounded by a new multicellular organism. And there we can see a new species with lots of blue and red cells. It's safe to assume, that one of these new species will soon dominate the world. Though an ecosystem is not a simple thing, it can always have sudden and significant changes, as we can see right now. The new species, and aggressive nomadic organisms, have emerged. These blue-red nomads started the cleanse of the world. Soon these organisms begin to devour the colonies. Now you can see the weird circular structures with an empty center. Herds of unicellular organisms roam the space, collecting the remnants of energy from the soil. The linear organisms with green cells emerge. Judging by the previous simulations, these are the most optimal organisms to coexist with aggressive nomads. The ecosystem experienced another complete rebuild, and now the world stepped into the new, the most diverse age. The linear organisms are pretty simple. They shoot seeds to clear their way, but seemingly do it at random intervals. The nomads are far more complex. They shoot seeds only when they encounter an obstacle.
The interaction of the linear organisms and the nomads forms a cycle. First, the linear organisms quickly reproduce and take large areas. Then the nomads start to devour them and reproduce. As the linear organism's population decreases, the population of the nomads decreases too. When the nomads' population decreases, it gives more space for the linear organisms to reproduce. And the cycle starts again. This model of the population dynamics of competing species is known as the Lotka-Volterra model. I've made my version of the model but added grass. Those are charts of the population of predators, herbivore organisms, and grass. You can see that the charts are shifted in time relative to each other. The ecosystem achieved stability. Most of the world is occupied by the linear organisms and the nomads. There are also a few colonies here and there. But I've noticed that the organisms inside the colonies have mutated. The mutation allows a singular cell to connect to a transport cell. By doing so, the cell can absorb part of the host's energy. If the cell encounters any non-transport cell, it just devours it. Including its species, yes. The only immune cells are the transport ones and seeds. After attaching to the host, a parasite turns into a seed and just absorbs energy. For some reason, all organisms with this mutation behave this way. It would be more effective to give branches, like parasitic plants in real life. Maybe they are just afraid to be devoured by other parasites. Any linear organism passing by colonies quickly becomes infested with parasites. Sometimes an organism carries so many parasites, that it cannot sustain its own life and dies along with them. Eventually, the parasites drifted away from the colonies and now they can be found all over the world. After absorbing a certain amount of energy, a parasite falls off and becomes a sprout. A sprout divides and gives birth to the two new parasites, which then start looking for hosts. They can't attach to the old host, as they are parallel to the original direction. Sometimes the parasites reproduce in another way. A parasitic sprout can give birth to three new organisms. One becomes a standard parasite, while two others transform into multicellular organisms. With such abilities, colonies are destined to play a big part in the ecosystem. Let's speed up the simulation a bit and see what happens. Forgot to mention, that there are still species of ancient unicellular non-parasitic organisms roaming the world. They move along the complex trajectory, devour other cells, and absorb energy from the soil. Over time, all the individual colonies merged into one super colony. A colony can be inhabited by many different species that form their ecosystem with their interactions different from what is happening outside. A particularly successful and efficient colonial ecosystem can expand and take the whole world. 
My simulation doesn't incorporate different environments, which makes it the unlikely formation of local independent ecosystems. But there is still a chance of survival for the linear organisms. A colony can have defects, and these defects create cavities in colonies. The linear organisms can occupy cavities, as we can see right now. The colony has other weak spots, so let's wait and see what happens next. Let's look at the life cycle of the two most common species of colonial organisms. The first one lives on the border with the outside world. He moves a lot exclusively in a straight line and can drift far away from the colony. It eats everything it meets on its way and can attach itself to another organism when the opportunity arises. Sometimes it can become a multicellular organism with a single seed. When the seed absorbs a certain amount of energy, it falls off and returns to its initial form. But sometimes the seed gives three branches with sprouts. Each sprout immediately falls off and becomes a new organism. This is how these organisms reproduce. Typical colonial organisms have a different life cycle. In the first stage, it moves a little, devours everyone who happens to be nearby, and absorbs energy from the soil. At some point, the organism turns into a multicellular one with two seeds. In this stage, their primal activity is to absorb organic matter from the soil. If the organism has lost all generating cells or its seeds have absorbed enough energy, then the seeds fall off and turn into two new organisms. This is how life looks deep inside a colony. When I explained the mechanism of the genome in the previous video, I mentioned the sprout's ability to move energy or organic matter beneath it in some direction. Let's see the case where this ability comes in clutch. This is a map of the distribution of organic matter in the world. You can see the area inhabited by linear organisms has a low concentration of organic matter. To survive in such conditions, organisms learn to move organic matter. The sprout moves the organics to the right and creates a red cell in this place. Then the sprout moves organic matter to the left and creates a green cell there. The more organic matter in the soil under the green cell, the more energy this cell can produce. Organic matter is not used and is a catalyst for photosynthesis. In this way, organisms can survive on poor soil. The appearance of the organisms remains the same, while their behavior has changed. This is one of the downsides of the simulation, it can be hard to notice changes. For example, I've overlooked the moment the first parasites emerged. I have to review the simulation step by step to see the changes. After a while, the new mutation occurred. Now the organism moves the energy forward and then a double amount to the place where the green cell will be. This allows it to generate more energy, as the green cells can do it indefinitely, while the red cells die after absorbing all available organic matter. The colony got another cavity, and the linear organisms began to fill it.
The organisms, used to poor soil, now live in the rich one. Let's see what they will do. Look at this cell. The organism moves the energy forward, and then a double amount to the place where the green cell will be. Because of the high concentration of organic matter, the soil becomes poisonous. The green cell dies. It gets worse. Let's move to another spot. The concentration of organic matter here is even higher and soil becomes poisonous at the first step. And the organisms develop a workaround. It shouts a seed to destroy the obstacle. This shows that the organisms are unable to get rid of their ancestors' mutation, develop to live on poor soil, and have to use workarounds. And then researchers wonder where such overcomplicated sequences came from. Evolution works in mysterious ways. The colonies descended into anarchy. The sprouts rapidly move from one organism to another, devouring everything they encounter. Somehow the system can survive and dominate the world. Some people believe that life is too complex to be just a coincidence. But the only thing needed to create a complex organism is a bunch of primitive organisms capable of reproduction. Then they evolve and become increasingly more complex. Even in my simulations with the simplest rules, there is a wide variety of worlds with complex interactions that can be endlessly studied. What can we even say about the real world, where opportunities are infinite? I've built a simple model. If complexity is a parameter that can increase or decrease in each generation with equal probability, then the highest complexity bar and the average complexity of organisms will only increase. All objects initially had a complexity equal to 1. Complexity changes randomly every step, but it is always bigger than 0. Due to this asymmetry, the chart shows how the average complexity of objects increases. If you remove the asymmetry and allow negative complexity, the average complexity will fluctuate at the same level, and the maximum and minimum values will infinitely diverge in different directions. In this simplest model, complexity is an abstract parameter that gives neither advantages nor disadvantages. In reality, it is necessary to take into account what outweighs in a particular case. Organisms may as well evolve into more simple forms. Since the competition between the colony and linear organisms lasted for a very long time, we will quickly move almost a million steps forward. Now the world is densely populated with small aggressive organisms and a large amount of organic matter in the soil. It seems unlikely that any other species can appear and survive here. The world remains the same even after 4 million steps. Life in simulation always reaches some kind of stable state, despite all my efforts. Maybe it is not the most optimal ecosystem, but a stable one nonetheless. Such stability can be disrupted only by external forces. I haven't used much in this simulation. In the real world, due to the activity of organisms, the Earth's ecosystem was completely rebuilt at least once, during the Great Oxidation event. Most mass extinctions with a complete rebuild of the Earth's ecosystem occurred because of external factors, such as volcanic activity or the fall of large cosmic bodies. During one of these rebuilds, intelligent life appeared. Maybe simulation with intelligent life will never achieve stability and will be able to cause a rebuild without external factors. 
but it is impossible to put that theory to the test in the real world, so our best bet is to create simulations like mine and study its patterns. While the appearance of the ecosystem remains the same, the genome of the organisms constantly changes. After 5 million steps, I saved the genome of several organisms from different ends of the map. In this table, you can see the number of matches in their genome. There are about 80% matches. After a million steps, I made another analysis. Organism's genome matches each other by 85%, but with their ancestors who lived a million steps ago, it matches by about 68%. Another million steps have passed, and the genome of organisms has already changed by more than half compared to their ancestors who lived 2 million steps ago. Organisms are increasingly adapting to the ecosystem. It is hard to predict how this can affect the stability of the ecosystem. Although the genome changes, about 20% of the genes are still the same for everyone. Most likely, these are the primary genes that define this species. Maybe the next time I'll make a more thorough analysis of the genome changes. By the way, after linear organisms went extinct, colonial organisms lost their parasitic abilities. That's it for today's video. I now work on videos about simpler simulations. For example, a simulation demonstrating the advantages of sexual reproduction. I haven't used this way of reproduction in simulations yet, but it's evident it speeds up evolution. Using a simple model, I will show why most species have a one-to-one -one sex ratio. Remember to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. Your support is my motivation to make new projects. To all my followers on Patreon, thank you. Until next time.